Welcome to Lecture 18 of Less Than Nothing, focused on Part 7 of Chapter 6, not only as substance, but also as subject. In this lecture, we conclude the chapter by focusing on the philosophical conception of the divide between the animal and the human. If you are following along with the book, you can find that this lecture will correspond to the subsection The Animal That I Am, in Chapter 6, not only as substance, but also as subject. In this part, we will actually be finishing chapter 6, and thus in the next lecture, we will be moving on to focus on interlude 3, King, Rabble, War, and Sex. Before starting the lecture, I want to quickly make a few notes. The first note is that one can find all of the transcripts of these lectures on my website under the work section. The second note is that the best way to help the future of this channel develop is to become a Patreon supporter. Thank you so much to all of the Patreons who have donated so far. Third, you can now find the first seven lectures of the start of Elenka Zupancic What is Sex uploaded over the past few weeks, and also lectures 11 through 17 focused on this current chapter of Less Than Nothing, if you want to make sure you are following along with the higher order narrative of the chapter and the book. I also uploaded three different lectures that I designed myself for the School of Thinking project, and I want to specifically highlight the Dialectical Thinking lecture, which focuses a lot on attempting to understand how you can deploy the tool of dialectical thinking in your own life and from your own perspective. Finally, on a personal note, I am interested in how I can be of more help to you. If you are an academic, a researcher, or just someone interested in philosophy and psychoanalysis, I am interested in exploring more the possibility of offering my own services on Skype for one-on-one -on -one help in either research, career development, or psychoanalysis. Please feel free to reach out to me by email or Patreon for more details. Now let's start the lecture. We start the final subsection of Chapter 6, titled The Animal That I Am. In this subsection, we approach through a Hegelian lens the issue of the divide between humanity and the animal kingdom, a topic that has structured much of philosophy from its inception to the present day. In particular, in this analysis, we focus on the challenge of the human-animal divide presented by postmodern critics of modern and ancient philosophy, which focuses on problematizing or deconstructing this divide. Zizek starts the lecture by neatly and concisely summarizing what he sees as the central problem of critics of the straw man Hegel, which is the Hegel of the absolute ideal, of the eating of all nature until we have a totalizing knowledge of nature. As covered in parts 1 and 2 of The Idea's Constipation, this motion does not capture the basic mechanics of the Hegelian dialectic. Thus Zizek states that, what the critics of Hegel's veracity need is thus, perhaps, a dose of a good laxative." End quote. Here Zizek aims to approach the fundamental philosophical antagonism between Descartes and Derrida on the topic of the human-animal divide. What is a human being? What separates a human being from the natural order or the animal kingdom? In this mode of questioning, it is clear that Zizek is clearly situated in helping us understand the meaning of Derrida's philosophical gesture. Descartes, of course, made the famous assertion of, I think, therefore I am, and in this assertion attempted to make a move from cogito to re cogitant, that is, from mental reflectivity to mental substance. In this move, the whole machinery of Cartesian dualism emerges, where mind and matter are irreducibly separated. In contrast to this movement, Zizek emphasizes that the human has no extra spiritual substance that would make it more than the animal. To quote Zizek himself, At the level of substantial content, I am nothing but the animal that I am. What makes me human is the very form, the formal declaration of me as an animal, end quote. What this means is that Zizek is not registering the move from mental reflectivity to mental substance. He is not reifying the human animal as a spiritual substance but instead noting this minimal difference that emerges with the human, the ability to recognize oneself as an animal. In Derrida's ironic stab at Descartes, the animal that therefore I am, he seeks to introduce his tool or weapon of deconstruction 
to assert that this clear differentiation between the animal as a general category and the human as a general category should be itself re-examined and re-analyzed, questioned, submitted to a new analysis. Throughout the history of philosophy, in Aristotle, Heidegger, Lacan, Levinas, we have a clear trend and affirmation in identifying what makes the human human in a positive addition to a fundamental lack in the animal. For example, and to quote Zizek, humans speak while animals merely emit signs. Only humans respond while animals merely react. Only humans experience things as such while animals are just captivated by their life world. That only humans can fiend to fiend while animals just directly fiend. That only humans are mortal, experience death, while animals just die, or that animals enjoy a harmonious sexual relationship of instinctual mating, while for humans there is no sexual relationship, and so on. To be precise, the Derridian tool of deconstruction, in this context, is not meant to be destructive in the sense of ignoring the issue of what separates us from the animals, but to problematize this issue on a deeper level. To quote, Derrida's point, All these differences between humans and the animal should be rethought and conceived in a different way, multiplied, thickened, and the first step on this path is to denounce the all-encompassing category of the animal." What Zizek offers in this Derridean gesture, as mentioned, is that the tendency in philosophy is to positivize the human and negativize the animal. Due to the influence of the Cartesian ontology, perhaps, we look for that recogitant, that spiritual substance that would set us apart, as if, with the emergence of the human animal, the hand of God separated us from the animal kingdom, making us special, giving us the ability to speak, to inhabit a world. However, Zizek pushes further than Derrida and may flip Derrida back on his head. He is quick to point out that the same gesture that Derrida critiques Descartes for, namely, the radical simplification of the animal, as a general category capturing all the diversity of the multiplicity of animal forms in a negative, positive characterization, is something that Derrida himself does vis-a-vis modern philosophy. In this move, he notes that Derrida reduces and simplifies the whole of philosophy to phallogocentrism, or the metaphysics of presence. The properly psychoanalytic point here is that when something radically new emerges, like modern philosophy with Descartes, or like postmodern philosophy with Derrida, the old all of a sudden loses its vital complexity and is reduced to a brutal simplification. The best examples of such a movement, where the new reduces the old to a brutal simplification, can be seen in the Hegelian movement of historical spirit itself. When humans emerged into nature with the ability to reflect on their animality, all of a sudden the animal was reduced to a violent simplification. And when Western philosophy or the Judeo-Greek legacy emerged in civilization, all other forms of civilization from the Oriental or the African or the American were reduced to a violent simplification. And when Eurocentric anthropology emerged with science, the demarcation between rational modernist humans versus irrational mystical humans solidified. In other words, when something new emerges, It delineates the otherness around it as a simplified external outside that can only be measured against the standards of the internal new. Zizek here, in a brilliant move, asserting that what Derrida attempts to deconstruct is in fact a feature of the emergence of the new. Quote, But it is not such a violent leveling a necessary feature of every critical move, of every rise of the new, Perhaps then instead of dismissing on block such binary logic, one should assert it, not only as a necessary step of simplification, but as inherently true in that very simplification. To put it in Hegelese, it is not only that, say, the totalization affected under the heading the animal involves the violent obliteration of a complex multiplicity. It is also that the violent reduction of such multiplicity of animal forms is to be conceived as a series of attempts to resolve some basic antagonism or tension which defines animality as such, a tension which can only be formulated from a minimal distance once humans are involved, end quote. This is so brilliant because it reveals, makes transparent, Derrida's own hypocrisy. 
Thus, what Derrida uses to critique the whole of philosophy, namely the fact that philosophers would reduce the animal to a violent, brutal simplification, Zizek uses to critique Derrida, namely that he reduces the philosopher to a violent, brutal simplification. In this way, Derrida, in his relation to his own contemporaries, like Deleuze and Lacan, becomes a paradoxical figure of totalization. We normally think of modern philosophy as totalizing and postmodern philosophy as a liberation into a multiplicity of nuance. However, Zizek clearly demonstrates that Derrida's own logical machinery can be flipped on him and shown how Derrida himself operates on mechanisms of totalization, whereas Deleuze or Lacan would engage with philosophers as individuals, each with a unique notional determination. Derrida would reduce all philosophers as engaging with the animal. To repeat again, Derrida's basic totalizing movement can be found in the fact that he simplifies the whole of Western philosophy and culture. Derrida claims that Western philosophy and culture would universally view the animal in the same way and with the same mechanisms of differentiation, ignoring all of the differences in conceptualization internal to Western philosophy and culture. Derrida achieves this feat with two basic operations, the first being the move claiming that Western philosophy is phallogocentric, meaning that Western philosophy deifies reason and language as the penultimate metaphysical presence, and the second being the deconstruction of all binary logic, which rips out the heart of the dialectical machinery where oppositional determination is fundamental. The consequences of such a move cannot but be conceived here as hypocritical in the sense that Derrida himself, in his own work, was phallogocentric, using language and reason to try to undermine language and reason, and using binary logic to undermine binary logic. This is why postmodernism tends often to unreflective hypocrisy, like for example producing self-loathing rich white bourgeois graduate students who hate their own culture and civilization. In this way, when we engage dialectically with Derrida, in the properly Hegelian sense, we must approach the fact that binary logic may itself be necessary in the field of language and reason. When we are attempting to analyze the complexity of the world around us, the move of binary logic, to separate and make an inside and an outside, is necessary for reason to make any progress in understanding itself and the world. Moreover, what Derrida recognizes as a simple negativity of philosophers to subtracting from the animal and adding to the human is in fact a totalizing moment of historical truth. The ability of humans to reflectively identify the animal is a truth of the spirit. This is because there was no such thing as the animal before the rise of the human. The animal is a notional determination that could only exist because of the rise of the human the proof of some monstrous new distortion in being. To quote Zizek on Marx's identification of the animal, quote, Recall the well-known elaboration of the general equivalent from the first edition of Capital, Volume 1, where Marx writes, It is as if, alongside and external to lions, tigers, rabbits, and all other actual animals, which form when grouped together the various kinds, species, subspecies, families, etc., of the animal kingdom, there existed, in addition, the animal, the individual incarnation of the entire animal kingdom, end quote. What this quote recognizes is precisely this Hegelian motion of totalization as truth, perhaps not surprisingly, considering how influenced Marx was by the Hegelian dialectic. We can here see the dimension of totalization that Zizek is aiming at, which is that the animal says less about the multiplicity of actual biological organisms, lions, tigers, rabbits, and much more about humans, the fact that we are encountering our own oppositional determination out there and attempting to define ourselves against this background. In this sense, we need to think about the difference between the actual, non-totalizable multiplicity of living forms, the lions, tigers, rabbits, and so forth, which may evade any brutal, violent simplification, and the virtual, the concept, as the totalizing category of all living forms, the virtual or the conceptual dimension of all living forms is not so much about the in itself of the actual non-totalizable multiplicity of living forms, but rather speaks to something that we should reflectively inscribe into the emergence of the human as such. Here, consider this observation in the following representation. 
when the history of philosophy can be conceived as the totalizing relation to the animal. We have to think of what it means that human beings are doing relating to this virtual conceptual determination. Zizek states that, insofar as it tells us anything, it is not that it is telling us about animals in themselves, but rather telling us that human beings are not human beings, but rather human becomings differentiating themselves conceptually from their natural background, but also, insofar as we can think about this determination from the perspective of the animal, we should think about not what the animal concept means for the in itself of the animal kingdom, but how the spectral animal, human species being, appears to the animal kingdom. To quote Zizek, what man encounters in the animal is itself in the oppositional determination viewed as an animal. Man is the spectral animal, existing alongside really existing animal kinds. End quote. This brings us back to a discussion and a representation that we covered in Lecture 11, the last interlude, Cogito in the History of Madness, where deconstruction insists that we rethink the divide between the animal and the human. Psychoanalysis offers a precise distinction. What psychoanalysis insists on is not the way in which animals appear from a particular historical human vantage point, but rather the rupture or break of the human as such. In psychoanalysis, the unconscious is not the realm of biological animal instincts and genetic regulations, but a novel, psychical territory of drives that escape reductions to biological programming. The unconscious is a virtual rupture with the biological that is in its own becoming. To quote Zizek, What this human-animal difference obfuscates is not only the way animals really are independently of humans, but the very difference which effectively marks the rupture of the human within the animal universe. It is here that psychoanalysis enters, the death drive as Freud's name for the uncanny dimension of the human in becoming. This in-between is the repressed of the narrative form, in Hegel's case, of the grand narrative of world historical succession of spiritual forms, not nature as such, but the very break with nature which is later, supplemented by the virtual universe of narratives." End quote. In other words, what psychoanalysis adds is not a positive feature that separates humans from animals, but rather the opposite, a radical negativity in the form of the death drive, that is almost like a cutting or a breaking from nature. The human narrative is, after the cut, a call out to recapture or reclaim a unity with nature that is always already lost, and self-consciousness is the mark of this loss. From this reasoning, we find a psychoanalytic response to Derridian deconstructive approach to the human-animal divide in relation to the negativization of the animal and the positivization of man. Quote, the answer to Derrida's claim that every feature attributed exclusively to man is a fiction could thus be that such fictions nonetheless have a reality of their own, effectively organizing human practices, that humans are precisely animals who become committed to their fictions, adhering to them scrupulously, end quote. This is the crucial ontological dimension of less than nothing that defines Zizek's attempt to redefine philosophy. The fiction is not something. Spider-Man, Star Wars, and Batman, for example, do not exist empirically in the material real of nature. But at the same time, the fiction is not nothing. It has a virtual efficacy on human historicity. The strange existence of Spider-Man, Star Wars, and Batman organize the life practices of millions of people and the psychical universes of billions of people. In other words, psychoanalysis insists that we cannot merely denounce the fiction or dream or illusion as just a fiction or just a dream or just an illusion. The virtual conceptual becoming of the human is something which has a real in and for itself. We can further analyze Zizek's point by taking the time to reflect on the relationship between Derrida and his own virtual other. In postmodern philosophy, we are often asked to reflect on a situation that Derrida recounts, a scene of encountering the gaze of his cat while he is naked in the shower. What this scene captures, according to Zizek, is the impenetrable, impossible gaze of the inhuman other within. The situation reverses the standard human-animal divide questions, as they tend to revolve on what animals lack and what humans possess. The situation Derrida is concerned with is the opposite. What are we humans to the animal gaze? 
Zizek claims that what we are to the animal gaze cannot be answered in itself, but rather reflects back into the human inhuman gaze, that our ability to even think the inhuman gaze of the animal is the primordial gaze of the other, as such. To quote Zizek, The cat's gaze stands for the gaze of the other, an inhuman gaze, but for this reason all the more the other's gaze in all of its abyssal impenetrability, seeing oneself being seen by an animal, is an abyssal encounter with the other's gaze since, precisely because we should not simply project onto the animal our inner experience, something is returning to the gaze which is radically other." End quote. This brings us to a quote from Adorno that Derrida's experience with the gaze of his cat should be universalized to philosophy as a whole. The human mind-body and its relationship to the otherness of the animal kingdom. In this situation, natural animal others, their impossible distance from us, the impossibility for us to imagine their life worlds, as in Thomas Nagel's infamous article, What is it like to be a bat? stands for the primordial emergence of philosophy. Philosophy exists in some sense because we are a radical rupture from the animal, because there is some gap where the universe of narratives, the universe of self-consciousness, is looking for an answer to its own being. Now, in the history of philosophy, the question of this gap has often been expressed as an inner suffering of nature. In other words, the gap between the animal and human emerged because nature in itself was suffering, longing to be released from the muteness, to be released from its slavery to the present moment. With the emergence of Logos, so the reasoning goes, nature was finally able to speak. Nature was finally able to articulate its suffering, to articulate its sadness. Derrida here stands opposed to this reasoning, claiming that this idea that nature in itself possesses a mute sadness or suffering, which is rendered reflective and conscious by humans, is yet another manifestation of phallogocentrism, yet another manifestation of teleological logocentric reasoning. Now, as Zizek attempts to do throughout this chapter, he seeks to affirm Derrida, only to then flip Derrida himself upside down with the use of the Hegelian dialectic. In this dialectical flipping of Derrida, Zizek asks, what is language for nature? As opposed to the standard question of, what is nature for language? In other words, it is not that nature in itself was sad and then Logos emerges to redeem nature, but rather, how does the sadness internal to Logos impact nature? Zizek claims that this is neither a teleological nor a logocentric question, but rather the absolute suspension of both teleology and logocentrism. The logical reversal is the same as the logical reversal of the Marxist reversal of the anatomy of man as the key to the anatomy of ape, a topic I attempted to cover in the first lecture of Alenka Zupancic, What is Sex? What happens in this reversal is not a recognition that in language we are redeeming a sadness in nature, but rather that in language, our belief that we are redeeming a sadness in nature is always already a feature of being in language itself, to quote Zizek. Following Benjamin, Derrida thus interprets this reversal as revealing that what makes nature sad is not a muteness and the experience of powerlessness, an inability ever to name. It is, in the first place, the fact of receiving one's name. Our insertion into language, our being given a name, functions as a memento mori, in language we die in advance, we relate to ourselves as already dead. Language is in this sense a form of melancholy, not a mourning. In it, we treat an object which is still alive as already dead or lost, so that when Benjamin speaks about a foreshadowing of mourning, one should take this as the very formula of the melancholy." End quote. This brings us to the consequence of asking the question, what is language for nature? Zizek runs us through a number of thought experiments of the way in which language affects nature, of the way in which language can wrap itself up into the world of animals, whether that be with naming our pets, subordinating them to linguistic codes, or whether that be the way in which the symbolic order of the human universe invades nature, destroying environments and tormenting wild organisms. In this way, we do not get lost in trying to understand nature in itself, but rather ask ourselves, how our language in itself transforms nature. This is why Zizek emphasizes that it is not the animal which defines the becoming of philosophy that we should meditate on. After the deconstruction of this category, we should be thinking of the spectral animal, namely, 
the becoming of the concept as such. In the difference between nature and language, in the emergence of the spectral animal, we see the emergence of an important centering phenomena which was clearly identified by the Hegelian dialectic. With nature it is clear that its center is outside of itself, and that its entire temporal deployment is a circling and striving towards the center outside of itself, for example with black holes. However, with language, or what Hegel referred to as the concept, we have the emergence of a phenomenon where the center is inside of itself. In other words, the minimal difference between the animal or nature and the human or the spectral animal is a minimal difference between the formation of a center towards which the phenomenon acts in relation to. The spectral animal or the human should be conceived as purely in itself, as striving for a center of its own world and its own realm. The spectral animal will never get to the real of nature in itself. The spectral animal will never know the inner world of the animal, but is in a sense doomed to circulate around its own center, its own extimate inhuman other. This can be represented or approached with the distinction not between the mind and some mental substance, but between mind and the abyssal otherness within that cannot hold a determinate substantial content. This is the abyssal otherness of the symbolic order, the center within that calls for our action. It is this logic that allows Zizek to, throughout this subsection, flip Derrida on his head, to quote Zizek. What if the perplexity a human sees in the animal's gaze is the perplexity aroused by the monstrosity of the human being itself? What if it is my own abyss I see reflected in the abyss of the other's gaze? Or in Hegelese, instead of asking what substance is for subject, how the subject can grasp substance, one should ask the obverse question, what is the rise of the subject for pre-subjective substance, end quote. This was a perspective that was eloquently approached by one thinker, the Christian theologian J.K. Chesterton, who Zizek frequently references throughout Less Than Nothing. Quote, Instead of asking what animals are for humans, for our experience, we should ask what man is for animals. Chesterton conducts a wonderful mental experiment along these lines, imagining the monster that man might have seemed at first to the merely natural animals around him. The simplest truth about man is that he is a very strange being, almost in the sense of being a stranger on the earth. In all sobriety, he has much more of the external appearance of one bringing alien habits from another land than of a mere growth of this one. He has an unfair advantage and an unfair disadvantage. He cannot sleep in his own skin. He cannot trust his own instincts. He is at once a creator moving miraculously hands and fingers and a kind of cripple. He is wrapped in artificial bandages called clothes. He is propped on artificial crutches called furniture. His mind has the same doubtful liberties and the same wild limitations. Alone among the animals, he is shaken with the beautiful madness called laughter as if he had caught sight of some secret in the shape of the universe, hidden from the universe itself. Alone among the animals, he feels the need of averting his thought from the root realities of his own bodily being, of hiding them in the presence of some higher possibility, which creates the mystery of shame. Whether we praise these things as natural to man, or abuse them as artificial in nature, they remain in the same sense unique." End quote. What Chesterton manages to achieve in this remarkable passage is to narrativize the inhuman gaze, the alien other within. When we look at the human animal, the spectral animal, from this point of view, we are looking at ourselves as if from the outside. When we do this, it becomes obvious that the real question is not what the animal lacks, but rather, what does the human lack? Why is it that the human animal seems like a rupture and a break with nature? Why is it that the animal, the human animal, appears as something that does not quite fit into the natural world, the natural run of things? This topic brings us back to the rise of the new and its consequent violent simplification of the old. When we think about the emergence of humans, what gets violently simplified is the realm of the animal which now has to deal with the consequences of the realm of language, the symbolic order. With the rise of Christianity or the Judeo-Greek heritage, the rest of humanity has to deal with the violent simplification into paganism and the consequence of the monotheist religion and the normative rituals that structure this worldview. With the rise of the modern West and scientific modernity, 
the rest of humanity has to deal with the violent simplification of being pre-modern mystical and irrational beings, and the consequences of the technological architecture that emerges. The question that Zizek asks here is not a moralistic, cultural relativistic one that seeks to demonize this monstrous rise of the hegemonic new, but rather an inquisitive psychoanalytic question of trying to understand how the old perceives the new, and how should we, the inheritors of the human, the Christian, and the modern, think the possibility of such a violent simplification if it is to emerge in the future. Consider the recent picture of an isolated Amazonian tribe encountering the emergence of a modern technological artifact in the form of a flying helicopter. By all appearances, this encounter should be as shocking as if we were to be visited by an alien extraterrestrial. However, what Zizek wants us to think is that we are ourselves this other. Therein resides the horror of these pictures. We see the terrified natives observing an inhuman other, and we ourselves are this other. How then do we humans affect nature? End quote. In this lecture, we started with the meditation on the distinction between Descartes' human-animal divide in res cogitant, mental substance, and the Derridian problematization of this divide. We then focused on the meaning of Derrida's introduction of deconstruction as something meant to thicken the conversation on the meaning of this difference. From this, we focused on the human-animal divide from a psychoanalytic perspective, introducing topics of the death drive and the status of the virtual. We then discussed not what the animal as in itself is, but rather what the human as the spectral animal is. From this, we played with the relation not between the old for the new, the animal for the human, but rather the new for the old, i.e. the human for the animal. Finally, we tried to understand what it means to be the incarnation of the other, to be the site of the emergence of the radically new. This brings us to the end of the lecture, the end of the subsection, The Animal That I Am, and also the end, finally, of chapter 6, not only as substance but also as subject. This chapter took seven lectures, but I hope that it was worth the journey. Throughout this chapter, we got a very thorough look at many crucial features of the Hegelian program, including the meaning of concrete universality, the status of subjectivity in Hegel's absolute, the nature of absolute knowing, and the dialectical machinery of sublation. In the next lecture, we will move on to Interlude 3, focused on politics and sexuality. Before leaving, I would like to once again remind you that if you benefit from these lectures and you want to see this channel grow into the future, the best way to help is through Patreon. By becoming a Patreon supporter, you will have more of a direct say in the becoming of this channel, and ensure that I will have the foundation that I need to continue to contribute to the future of philosophy in the 21st century. I also want to reiterate that if you need help with anything related to philosophy, research, academia, psychoanalysis, or related topics, please feel free to reach out to me and inquire about possible Skype sessions. I want to find a way that I can be useful to you as possible. You can easily reach me through email or Patreon. Thanks again to all of my Patreon supporters for sticking with me throughout this lecture series. Finally, you can help this channel out by subscribing, commenting, sharing, and liking this video. And you can also watch or rewatch the playlist of this series in order to follow the higher order narrative of less than nothing. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you again next time.